Dr. Victor Cabrera is a professor and extension specialist in dairy management at the University of Wisconsin-Madison Dairy Science Department. Dr. Cabrera combines applied research, interdisciplinary approaches, and participatory methods to deliver practical, user-friendly, and scholarly, scholarly decision support tools for dairy farm management. These scientific tools are aimed to improve dairy farm profitability, environmental stewardship, and long-term sustainability of the dairy farm industry. During his career, Dr. Cabrera has developed more than 40 decision support tools, published over 70 refereed articles and nine book chapters, presented in more than 100 scientific sessions, and given talks on more than 400 extension meetings in Wisconsin, other states, and such, several other countries. Dr. Cabrera's work in the past 12 years has been pivotal to attract more than $5 million to support his research and extension initiatives. Dr. Cabrera has been distinguished with the American Dairy Science Association and has received just a plethora of awards. Um, rather than spending time listing off those awards right now, I'm going to go ahead and, and use that time um, for him to go ahead and start on his presentation. Uh, he will be speaking on us or, or to us today on the dairy, bar, the dairy Brain Project from Data to Insights. Again, if you have any questions, you can leave them in the chat box next to the YouTube stream. Uh, and with that, I will pass the stage over to Dr. Cabrera. Thank you. Can you hear me well? Yes. Great. So I would like first to uh, start thanking the organizing committee for this kind invitation and actually the nice opportunity to share what we think is a very exciting work we are doing in Wisconsin. So uh, I would like to mention that this is a team effort. As you can see in the screen there, it is a highly interdisciplinary group of colleagues that we are working together on this. There are people from computer sciences, data sciences, and animal and dairy sciences. You may recognize some of the faces there from the dairy or animal domain, but some other would be unfamiliar to you. And that's the great thing here, the team that we have been able to assemble. So today, what I'm gonna share with you is the basic concepts and the motivation of our project together with the description, vision, and some preliminary analysis uh, of some practical applications that are intended to provide data-based insights. So we are also very fortunate to have the most diverse lab of dairy farms in Wisconsin. And even more importantly, their willingness and commitment to collaborate with us in this project. They share our vision and help us a lot to overcome all the challenges that are coming every day. At the moment, we have a system installed on five farms. And at the moment, we don't wanna grow, we wanna learn a lot. We selected the farms actually with the intention to be exposed to all the different technologies and systems of data collection, data generation, that will likely provide us a step further when we decide to scale up our project. We are also very privileged uh, to count with access and resources from the Wisconsin Institute from Discovery, which includes top academics, state-of-the-art facilities, and one of the most advanced computer and server systems. All of our data are physically stored and manage in this UW, UW Center for High Throughput Computing that is physically inside this building. This has been our basic concept and continues to be and will continue to be uh, for this project of the Dairy Brain. If I would be asked to summarize the project in just one slide, this would be the one. We are looking for a continued loop of feedback of data collection at the farm, their safe transfer to the central location, their challenging transformation, and very importantly, their harmonization so analytical services can be effectively applied. So we want to provide insights and knowledge in the form of decision support tools that provide value added to the data and therefore guarantee the sustainability of the whole system. So the overall system should be prepared actually 
to learn from the past and adjust to the future, providing not only dashboards and projections, but prescriptive analytics, applying the latest technologies and the latest scientific knowledge. Here it is our overall motivation. This is a typical Siloit dairy data ecosystem. I'm pretty, pretty sure you will find this very familiar. Data streams live in disconnected silos on a dairy farm. Regardless if the farm has more or less data generators or collection systems, the challenge and as well the big opportunity is all too familiar. These systems do not talk to each other. They are their own system. There are some attempts of integration and most of them are exclusively by the industry people but there is no system at the moment indeed in place and that is capable of connect effectively and continuously and use efficiently the data of all these systems or many of these systems at one time. So it is common that farmers, and you may have seen this, that will have different computers on the farm for different systems. And those computers are completely separate one from the other. And they will depend on the vendor and they are not integrated. So one important goal we have in this project is uh, to develop an agricultural data hub on the bottom here. And uh, <clears throat> this would be like a funnel that will connect and, and, and bring all the data together, but live in a real time or close to real time uh, so we can homogenize the data and we can provide the data to the decision support tools and assist and aid in the decision making on dairy farms. So as such, we are following four main objectives. One on the bottom here, nurture, create and nurture a coordinated innovation network that is guiding and will continue guiding our entire project. Two here, develop and maintain a system to collect clean aggregate data streams from farms that we are calling, what we are calling, and it's very challenging at the moment, the agricultural data hub. Then we go number three here, which is the specific dairy brain, dairy brain per se, that we understand that as a suite of analytical modules and decision support tools. And finally on top here, we also want to disseminate this as much as possible to our stakeholders, so we have a strong extension component as well. So we are looking to create what the data and, 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 and uh, computer people will call an evol evolutionary ecosystem of data that can exchange data and also insights. At the heart of the system is this agricultural data hub but nothing would work without the advice and input from our coordinated innovation network group of people. The agricultural data hub will receive all the data or it's receiving the data from the farm systems, which cleans, harmonize and allows access, provide access to farm specific descriptive, prescriptive and predictive analytics. So it is important to note that uh, we are open to external innovators or external collaborators, whether they are companies or research institutions, which could also become innovators in the whole system. They can use the data and they can provide additional insights. Uh, I think that's a system that will provide better sustainability into the future. So let's take a look at an example. And as you can see here, this is a completely different domain. Some of those icons on the screen actually will look familiar to you. Uh, and mostly if you are an Apple user like myself, and according to the statistics, about two thirds of US adults would be Apple users somehow. So this is actually my own system. And this refers basically to only iPhone and Apple Watch. I do track 
my activity, activity daily. And these are the circles here. Those of you who are familiar with the activity app, uh, you know about the obsession some of us have to close these circles every single day as much as we can. Along those circles, I used to have, I mean, a few years back, one app for swimming, another for biking, another for running. I still have them and I like them because they have some quality stuff. I, I, I do like them. Even though today the activity app from Apple has also some apps for swimming and running and also biking. But I still like the old ones, uh, but I keep using them only if, only because they can connect effectively with the activity app. And that's pretty simple, actually. It seems very, uh, <clears throat> very simple and easy to be true, but it is. Uh, it is very straightforward. If I give permission, these apps share data with the activity app from Apple, for example. That's completely different, for example, if we talk about the dairy industry and I wanna collect, I wanna connect, for example, fit supervisor with dairy comp 305, for example. That would not happen. We would need to do a lot of stuff and it would not be consistent, continuous, and it would not be uh, actually easy to do it. Moving on in this graph here, we, uh, we have other apps. I'm not very keen on these ones. It's just because I have a couple of uh, teenager kids that use uh, caloric intake and uh, the monitoring of weight and body fat on the, on the body. Uh, so, but I do know that this can connect also with the activity and other apps on my Apple Watch and my iPhone. What I do track in addition to the activity part is blood pressure and sleeping, for example. I do have monitors for those and those connect not as well as the others, but they do have a good connectivity enough to make it work in the whole system. And as you may be familiar as well, there is a health app that aggregates a lot of data, mostly from Apple, but is capable to connect all the uh, data from different third vendor apps as well. And I do have my own app here that is my chart that's a local in Wisconsin with aggregates a lot of data of my visits to the doctor and the health records and uh, my lab tests, for example. And if I ever want to connect this with a major uh, clinic or a, a hospital, I should be able to do it simple enough uh, if needed, when needed, right? So I'm not advocating we should follow exactly this in the dairy industry, but I do think there are a lot of good learning lessons here that we could apply and we should use in the dairy industry. I mean, the first point I want to make, and, 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 and probably the most important here, that this works. And if we look other domains like bank, for example, it works just very uh, fine. And the issue of, um, uh, for example, confidentiality and security of the data uh, can be overcome, which is something we need to take into consideration. OK. So before I go to the center of the presentation, which is gonna be the agricultural data hub and the actual dairy brain, I just would like to take a few moments to give you a little background on the coordinated innovation network here and the extension a little later. So we do have at the moment established our coordinated innovation network. It has at the moment about 90 members from all over the world and from very, very different backgrounds, people from the industry, a lot of farmers, academics, etc. So the goal is to have this group guiding us from the start to the end uh, to move the project and also start a discussion about the data issues uh, on the dairy production systems. And so, we formally created this coordinated innovation network last year about September. And the first thing we did as a group, actually we split in smaller groups and we published five articles in Horst Derriman. Some of you may have seen these articles between February and May this year appear. And uh, the intention of these articles were to provide some thought 
provo provoking articles to start a large discussion and, and we are still uh, welcoming input. We have a forum area in our website. So if you are interested on participating on the Coordinated Innovation Network or in the discussion, uh, please do so. We intend, the next thing we intend to do within, within the Coordinated Innovation Network is to develop these more in-depth, more technical design documents uh, about data ownership, data security, best practices for data collection and communication, APIs, application programming interfaces, and how we can strategize to monetize these APIs in the dairy industry. We don't pretend to solve uh, the problems, maybe not even uh, <clears throat> Uh, describe them completely, but we wanted to start the discussion and hopefully these will, uh, in, in a few years, help in the development of more efficient use of data on the dairy farms. So with that, I'm just going to move on a couple of slides about extension. So we have an uh, offer in the project we are running, a multi-touch uh, extension program. And we are trying to work as much as we can, COVID permitting, to increase the awareness of our project and ideas to the large constituents and farmers and county educators. So uh, we have these demonstrations, seminars, webinars, etc. But at the center of our extension program is what we call the data money program. And let, let me tell you just uh, a little bit about more uh, of, about the data money. It's basically, uh, <clears throat> uh, it is a farm-based system in which uh, we can facilitate a team within the farm to better help them improve the use of their data. So normally the farm-based team would have the farmer, the veterinarian, a nutritionist, maybe a consultant, a financial consultant, for example, uh, but externally, it will have normally the county extension educator and some researchers from our group, uh, we participate on that, to support the use of integrated data on those farms. The farms involved in the data money doesn't need to be part of the research project. The idea, and they don't need to have any specific technology of data collection on their farms. We believe every single farm has an opportunity and a challenge to connect data and better use those data. So we try to facilitate that process within the uh, data money program. So now let's move on to the research part. So our agricultural data hub, I believe I, uh, my vision is that like it is the heart of the project and we'll be able to collect harmonize and store and distribute the data efficiently with all the proper permissions. There will always be a, a lock here that we are very careful about the safety and the confidentiality of the data. So this slide and a few more after this are courtesy of Steve Wongen, who is a uh, a data scientist in the project who is in charge leading this part of the agricultural data hub. So the first step on this agricultural data hub is getting access to the data, which involves getting the data off the farm and into our centralized system. Actually, the next few slides are courtesy, as I, I mentioned uh, before, of Steve, who has been working on this uh, very kindly and, and very strongly actually in the last months. We hope to have uh, an example of this, uh, a proof of concept, uh, hopefully before the end of the year. So the most advanced software components are cloud-based and offers access to data via application programming interfaces. What I mentioned before, APIs, which is the most advanced way to share data nowadays. But these are still rare in dairy production systems. More often, the data is collected by different systems produced by different companies. And it is only available 
by ac accessing files stored on a local computer located at the farm. So in order to make the data available to our servers, what we are doing is we develop a client, a computer in, in the farm that distribute this data farm to our servers. So then once the, the files become available in our servers, the next step is to decode the data. And this is actually a very challenge task. The files from different softwares are vastly heterogeneous as you may, may have expect and farms often utilize different software and a number of different vendors. While each software requires some custom scripting for data extraction, we develop a system in which it's easy to reuse uh, some of the scripts. So we're trying to automatize this system. Uh, while we still need to perform the time consuming task of writing the, the scripts, the code to extract the data efficiently, uh, we are trying to, to make this as automatic as possible and integrate that in a workflow uh, efficiently the best way we can. Once the data becomes available in our database, we perform the cleaning. And one important thing, the quality assurance of the data. I mean, this includes removing duplicate entries. You have all seen these kind of things or actually incomplete, incomplete records, records or actually uh, spurious records or uh, data that doesn't make sense. This is also a high time consuming process and needs its own scripting and actually needs to be programmed and uh, there is at the moment actually a team of three or four undergrad computer uh, major students working on this. Homogenizing is the next step, which involves identifying and extracting the common parts of the data uh, that record the same type of data. So this includes like standardizing units, terminology, types of measures, intervals and much, much more as you may have expected. So doing so allows our data actually to be used in a consistent way. So it doesn't matter if the software uh, is X and the other software in the different farm is Y, at the end, our data needs to be consistent uh, in our database. And the final step in this agricultural data half uh, ambition at the moment is to connect those data sources, which is the integration or the aggregation of the data. This is also a very challenging task. Uh, linking, like for example, the feed data with the production, the health and the genetic information and many other information. These are the data from the farm, but we should connect also this data with external uh, information or data like weather or prices, for example. So there are a number of issues to achieve this. One issue is, for example, what's called computer scientists called tractability of individual, in this case, individual animals. Uh, so for example, some systems uh, use a tag number to identify the animals. Some others use a registration number and there are even a different uh, other ways to identify the animals. So, so before we try to connect the data, we need to make sure we are using exactly the same common denominator uh, in the connection system. So let's move on now to our dairy brain portion of the project. Uh, this is the ultimate step in our project. And, and this is the, the main motivation what we have done, all what we have done so far. So the way to conceptualize this is, a, I would say, data-driven engine of decision-making to advance analytics and dairy farm sustainability. So we categorize our models as those descriptive, like, for example, summary dashboards that show the current situation and may include some simple calculations. Most of the tools that we see available today, uh, even without integration of data sources, are basically descriptive. But our vision goes much beyond that. Uh, we need to capitalize on the integrated data. And a number of our tools will be predictive, which forecast into the future. 
and our most advanced models would be prescriptive. And those are the ones that actually provide suggestions and probably using optimization methods of the best course of action to do for some specific strategic decisions. These two will need to be adjusted with continuous data and will require the most advanced analytics for, for example, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning uh, techniques to do that. And that will pro prove the value added uh, of the whole system. So we have the concept, we have many pieces working. Uh, not everything is connected at the moment, but we are very hopeful uh, this proof of concept and the added value will be provided sometime soon, hopefully within this year. So here it's a list we promise actually in the in our latest grant of potential decision support tools uh, that we can produce as exemplars. The more granularity we will have on the data, the more fine the calculations could be. But that will depend on the farm conditions. They have different systems. And we believe the value added will exist in any farm, uh, but they will have different levels of challenges and opportunities depending on the data they have available. So on top in this table, for example, we will have these descriptive operational short-term tools such as daily feed efficiency or daily income, milk income or feed costs. That even though the calculation is very trivial, very simple, in fact, they do require continuous data aggregation. Uh, only if we have the continuous data aggregation, we can provide the important insights. We can do this manually, but we cannot do manually every single day or, or even every single week, for example. Then in the middle, we have these tactical midterm uh, predictive tools uh, that require more advanced analytics, obviously, and could inform on the selection of healthier cows, for example, or best candidates for replacement, just to put some examples. And finally, at the bottom here, we have those most ad more more advanced tools that draw on more data streams and they are long-term strategic and potentially prescriptive tools. For example, here we can uh, provide better information for more accurate feeding of the animals, uh, or we can use other techniques, for example, to provide some suggestions of breeding, better breeding, genetic progress and culling policies on the, on the herd. So it's difficult what could happen in five years from now to predict what's gonna happen and what potentially would be the best option today that's gonna give us the best result five years from now. But if we have all the data integrated, we can have a much better idea and we can have much better uh, sustainability in the long term. So next, I'm gonna discuss a couple of tools we are developing at different uh, levels of development at the moment. So this one, for example, we already have a publication out and the whole algorithms are already in place. We are expecting and we're waiting for the aggregated data to come together in order to implement this the best way possible on a farm or a number of farms, okay? So this is about improving nutritional accuracy on dairy farms. This is the work of a former student in my group, Jorge Barrientos, he's now in, in Cornell. And this, re, uh, this is about nutritional grouping and providing accurate diets or more accurate diets to cows as a effective strategy to control cost, increase revenue and enhance overall feed efficiency. So using few diets as many farmers do, uh, not allocate, allocating cows to groups according to their requirements or not reformulating diets increases costs of feeding and exacerbates metabolic issues and other issues as well. On the other side, farmers already group animals for many reasons or other reasons, but they don't adjust the diets accordingly. And, and farms have on-farm data streams, computer and feeding systems, and 
uh, what requires data integration and some good analytics like the Data Brain project to provide this opportunity and facilitate the effective application of nutritional grouping and more accurate diets, for example. Uh, improve overall the nutritional accuracy, in this case, of the lactating herd. Here's the concept, very simple. Farmers provide the same diet or only a few diets, right? Let's, let's talk about a group of animals. Let's say uh, the pig lactation animals, they all receive the same diet, okay? And this diet actually normally is not consistently to the requirement of animals and it is not continuously reformulated normally, okay? Uh, so the proposed change is to actually use an algorithm like a cluster, for example, and uh, group animals according to the requirements. And then to each one of these groups provide a diet that is closer to the requirements. That's the whole idea here. It gets complicated with all the data and how farms perform, but this is the basic concept. So this is what actually happens on a farm in Wisconsin. This farm has about 2,400 lactating cows and they are housed in 14 pens to which they are reassigned weekly. So they move cows weekly. Even though the farm is highly technified, the process of selecting the cows to be moved from one pen to another pen is basically done by hand in paper with some screenshots and printouts. And mostly based on the experience and expertise of the farmer and the manager. So every Monday afternoon happens that the farmer creates a list of cows to be moved to a different pen. The night crew of employees actually used RFIDs, electronic gates that help quite a bit, and a computer system to move the cows. Then on Tuesday early morning, actually they need to verify because there are some always errors as we may expect to try to comply the best they can with the original plan. So this system takes a lot of effort. Uh, there are a lot of errors as we will see, and it is an inconsistent across time. Above all, I think the most important point I wanna make here is cows are not allocated to pens according to the requirements and diets are not based on the resulting cows in each one of the pens, okay? So here is what's happening in the farm. Okay, let me, let me go through this with you. I mentioned there are 14 pens and here is number from one to 14 on the Y axis, okay? The 14 pens are shown uh, as I was, I was saying uh, or horizontally here, but they are in the Y axis, okay? And, uh, and also here I'm showing the density of the diet only as an example, the net energy of lactation that they are providing to each one of these uh, groups. Actually, you can see, as I mentioned before, there are nine diets. So for example, the peak of the multiparous cows here uh, receives a diet, and then the peak of the primiparous cows also receives another diet. And there is a here the late lactation. There are two pens here that receive the same diet, for example, okay? So although they mix nine diets, it's clear these diets miss a large number of animals in each pen due to high variability of the animals. And the variability here, you can see is only days in milk and primiparous and multiparous, okay? Uh, supposedly, for example, here, there should be only the pig lactation animals of the multiparous, but you can see there are a lot of outliers. These cows actually should belong to the late lactation. Or these cows here, as you can see marked in red, shouldn't belong here. These cows should belong uh, <clears throat> somewhere else here in the multiparous group, but they should be blank here according to the original plan, okay? So there are a lot of misclassified cows and outlier cows. It's important to emphasize that the diets are formulated 
by price of ingredients and not by requirements. That's another very key point here. And it is done three or four times a year. So the nutritionist changed the diet just because prices of the feed change or they are buying a new uh, feed ingredient in large quantities, for example, for the farm. And so the point is, no matter which cows will come to the peak, for example, of the primipers here, the diet will be very consistent regardless of the requirements of the cows indeed, okay? So if we see this as a graph, I hear uh, I'm just re-emphasizing the point. We have on the x-axis, the net energy of lactation, mega cows per kilo of dry matter. And on the y-axis, we have the metabolizable protein on grams per kilo of dry matter. So this is the peak of the multiparous. And in total, for multiparous, there are about 480 cows. And they are housed in three pens each pen about 160 cows. But uh, they are already split in three pens, but they receive the same diet. So a cow classified as a pig multiparous would go to any of these pens indistinctly. There is no reason to put one cow in one pen or another pen because the diet will be the same for all the three pens, right? Uh, but there is an opportunity here to actually move uh, cows different cows to different pens. Uh, it would not take too much within the farm system, if, if any, a little additional effort to do so. Uh, however, that would require additional formulation of diets. They are doing already nine diets. They could do two more diets, for example, that shouldn't be a big deal indeed. Uh, and here, if they are giving only one diet to all these cows, 480 cows in peak of multiparous, probably the diet would, would be at this point uh, regarding energy and regarding protein, metabolizable protein. If we would do three diets indeed, uh, probably one of the diets would be higher than the current diet, but that will only cover a third of the animals. The other two diets will be much lower and indeed, if we put together the three diets and we average them, we will be providing much less density diet in total overall, and we will be saving a lot of cost. And we are not going to be producing more or less. Probably, if anything, we would be improving productivity rather than decreasing productivity with that. But we will be saving a lot of cost. So what we propose is this prescriptive model to allocate cows to pens and suggest more accurate diets to each pen. This requires continuous integrated data, at least at the very minimum, the herd data and the feed data. Okay, they need to be fused and using uh, keys like, for example, pen ID and date. For more detailed calculation, the framework could use other data, like, for example, the milking powder data, if we want, if we want more granularity. Okay, also the system needs to be connected somehow to the diet formulation software and needs to be consistent. All of this has been prepared by Jorge in R, but we are uh, right now moving this to Python that is our preferred uh, code programming for the whole project. Okay, so here it is the difference. We apply that model, we have the data of the farm and look what happens. Uh, now we are proposing for each one of the pens, for the 14 pens, a different diet. Can be done on the farm very easily. Uh, that shouldn't be a big deal in this, indeed, okay? Uh, and you can see there would be clear improvements and very little misclassified cows, okay? Keep in mind, here the classification, we're trying to follow the farm the way they work. Uh, this is primiparous, multiparous, daisy milk, okay? And so we are following the criteria of the farmer. Like for example, in these three pens, there should be the peak lactation of multiparous and here the peak lactation of primiparous. And we have very little outliers or misclassified animals according to that. But if we would see this according to the nutritional requirements, Indeed, in each one of these pens, we will have much more closer, much more homogeneous animals according to their requirements. We will be improving the 
nutritional accuracy. Uh, diets could be reformulated weekly as cows are being moved weekly. But just to make a fair comparison, we kept the diet the same for the nine weeks we did the analysis in this case. And this is what we found when we compare our proposed practice with the current practice on the farm. This, again, I just want to emphasize, requires that we will have the data aggregated on a permanent basis and do the reanalysis every week. But once this is done, it would be very automatic. Okay. So the diets, as I mentioned before, were maintained for nine weeks. And you can see here that the our proposed practice will have much less number of animals misclassified and much more consistent number of cows per pen, which is desirable. Uh, so the diets are assured to be more accurate in each pen uh, with the proposed practice. Uh, and actually that's been seen here when we compare the proposed practice with the current practice, we have a gain in most of the cases in saving costs. This is only saving costs here. If we put all these numbers together, the overall gain in this case is $31 per cow per year, okay? Uh, the positive signs here mean, for example, this is primiparous peak lactations. These are multiparous peak lactation. You can see two of the diets have a much lower cost than what they are currently having. And there will be a diet that probably will be more expensive with our proposed. Okay, but there are some other uh, peculiarities here. Like for example, the very late lactations, the most late lactation here, our diet is more expensive than the diet the farm is providing. We believe like, for example, here, the farmer is providing a much lower dense diet that the cows require in these late lactation animals. Indeed, if we would do only the analysis for the peak lactation, for example, the most important here, uh, the difference would be even higher here, okay? So the gain expected is to be greatly. And one thing I just wanna mention here is we are assuming that the milk will remain constant in all cases. The gain is only in feet, but we would expect that the productivity of the animals will be improved. But not only that, the health of the animals will be improved and potentially the fertility of the animals and the environmental footprint of the herd as well, because there will be less excretion of nutrients. And I'm just uh, moving here towards the end of the presentation with this last vision of an application. This is, uh, has been all already started. There is some data. And this is the work of uh, two students in the lab, Wen Li and Manfei Li. They have the same last name, but they are not related at all. So the vision is to optimize the decisions of breeding, genetics, and culling, and looking at the outcomes in the long term. Again, this is a prescriptive framework, and that would require a cow level, highly integrated decision support that also assess the herd and farm level outcomes. At the end, the goal is to provide specific suggestions of breeding, genetics, genomics, culling at the cow and herd level for best sustainability according to farm goals. But the important thing here, you should be able to learn according to the actual outcomes. So it should be able to compare what the farmer is doing regardless of the suggestions and how that could be improved across time. So the use of beef semen, as we know, this is as an introduction of the concept here, why we want to do this. Uh, beef semen is about, in Wisconsin, 20% now uh, of all the breedings, and sex semen about all the 20%. So we have only, nowadays, about 60% of conventional semen on dairy farms. This may be in part because of the attractive price of the crossbred uh, beef breedings. Uh, and this has relationship, relationship with the use of sex semen, obviously, in order to make a space to use more beef semen, we use more sex semen. 
So it's lo logical to breed superior animals to sexy men and inferior animals to beef, which increases the genetic progress because intense selection, uh, we avoid inferior replacements and lower interval between generations. On the other hand, genomic tests is becoming also widely popular as we know, right? And, uh, uh, and it would improve even more the genetic progress. There are good publications out there from other groups uh, out from us that show the value of that. However, the specific decision here is challenging because it needs to be combined with possible productive protocols, genetic information, genomic testing, age and status of the cows, culling protocols, among many other factors, including even market conditions. So at the moment, for example, it is unknown which general option would be the best for a particular farm. To use sex semen and beef semen for all the cows, use only in part and combine that with uh, a genomic test or uh, anything else in between. Actually, more specifically, uh, what every single cow would receive as a breeding protocol should be of interest on the farmers. We have all the data, we have the technology to do that. And I think that would be the next step to be much more efficient in this aspect on dairy farms. So this is just an example and uh, I'm very close to the end here uh, of possible projections. And these projections will be used for the pre prescriptive framework. It shows, for example, the expected genetic progress resulting from breeding and selection protocols. And we have A, B, C here, and you can read them using different levels of sex semen, beef semen, and conventional semen, and whether we keep or sell the calves or the springers, okay? So uh, this, ex this prescriptive recommendation would, for example, give us at the end, uh, something like that, right? Uh, we should reach a level in which we, we will be able to provide a suggestion to the farm and say, uh, provide or use sex semen in your first lactation animals. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, use sex semen, for example, in the three first breedings of the heifers and the first breeding of the first lactation animals and all other adult animals in the 20% top genetic for example. Then use conventional semen in the rest of heifers and uh, first lactation cows. And for all the other breedings, use beef semen. This at the end, we expect it's gonna give you with your uh, fertility and, and reproduction performance about 20% of extra calves. So then you can use genomic tests, but it's not as simple just use genomic tests. In order to save money and be more effective with the genomic test, uh, we would propose to first rank the animals based on the parent uh, genetic value. And from that ranking to just select the 30% middle animals, test only those animals, and then re-rank the animals and select out of the farm the 20% bottom animals, okay? I'm just giving a little of, of detail here, but the point is we should be able to provide that kind of information to farmers uh, for optimizing their reproduction, genetics, and culling policies. And here I'm just uh, finishing up. I just wanna recognize and acknowledge uh, the funding sources. Uh, this is the UW 2020 initiative from the University of Wisconsin that gave us uh, this very nice uh, seed grant that allow us to assemble this nice group uh, within the University of Wisconsin. This ended last year and we were able and happily to get a larger grant from the Food and Agriculture Cyber Informatics and Tools Initiative uh, from the USDA NIFA uh, that started last year and we still have two more years to go on this one. We're very grateful of the support that's allowing us to continue with this project. And with that, I would like to leave you with our website. Uh, please visit us and I will be more than glad to entertain questions if there are any. Thanks.
Thank you so much for that talk, Dr. Cabrera. It's really exciting to look ahead and see uh, some of the opportunities we have to look forward to uh, in the not too far distant uh, future. So, so thank you very much for that. Um, one question before we move on to our next speaker. Uh, you talked a little bit about data cleaning. Um, you've mentioned a little times, you know, some of your outliers, some of your miscategorized animals. Uh, and I know that even still right now, um, there are uh, producers or, or managers who struggle with good uh, record keeping practices. Do you have any recommendations for, for best practices for data management in the short term uh, as we look forward into the future and being able to hopefully get um, our maximal use out of some of these records? A standardization, a standardization, and as much standardization we can use uh, will be very helpful to everyone. I mean, the new vendor, the new software, uh, they are being uh, a little more careful with that, which helps uh, that, for example, uh, just to give an example, uh, Boba Sync doesn't allow us, allow a farmer, for example, well, they allow farmers to name mastitis whatever they want, but internally it is coded just one way. So whenever we extract the data, it's very uh, consistent to us. Uh, in other systems, for example, we can find five different ways farmers will call mastitis. It will depend on the person that coded or the, <clears throat> the time that was done. And so we need to actually even use machine learning to connect those data and to uh, go through the data to, to, to make sense of the information. So as much consistent and standard could be the data on the farm, it would be very helpful. It would be very nice. Our coordinated innovation network group, one of the points we're trying to start a larger discussion is about the standardization and ways of collecting data much more efficiently on dairy farms. So uh, hopefully that's coming as well. Uh, there is uh, this, the International Center, ICAR, that is uh, based in Europe, that's trying to propose also standard uh, ways to collect data and manage data on dairy farms. So we're trying to learn from all that, but there are not specific things. We don't have a guideline for data collection on dairy farms, for example. 